we simply cannot do that as, as Christians. Uh, we should not and we cannot because we believe uh, in a set of 66 books that we call Scripture. I'm Richard Henry. We've got a guest today, Dr. Adam Howell, a friend and uh, church member, fellow church member as well. Uh, we've been knowing each other for six years, right? Something like yeah. Or more, probably six plus. Yeah, I think it's six plus. Uh, he is an assistant professor of Old Testament interpretation here at Boyce College in Louisville, Kentucky. And we're going to be talking about some important issues, uh, mainly in the Old Testament department. Uh, that's his field. Uh, we're going to be looking at unhitching the Old Testament. Should we do it? Should we not do it? Um, how that relates to the New Testament. And so yeah. on. Uh, but first, let's talk a little bit about you. Okay. Um, so where are you from originally? Yeah, good question. So I grew up in uh, East Tennessee. Um, in the uh, It's called the Tri-Cities area, Johnson City, Kingsport, Bristol. If you're familiar with NASCAR racing, the Bristol Motor Speedway oh, yeah. is uh, yeah. up there. So that's where I, I grew up in the Appalachian Hills of Tennessee and moved to Louisville in 2003 to begin the MDiv and did both uh, MDiv and PhD here. Awesome. And uh, wife, children? Yeah, so my wife's name is uh, Liz, and we've been married for 16 years, and we have four children, Noah, Tova, Judah, and Nora, and uh, they all just changed birthdays in the fall. They all just had birthdays in the fall, so they are now 13, 11, 9, and 8. <laughs> Tova's 11. Tova's 11, that's right, and Noah's 13 and just got braces today. Oh, fun. We were doing that, maybe. Yeah. Um, favorite book of the Bible? Mm. Of course, that probably changes. It does. I was going to say, you have to qualify that with favorite book of the Bible <laughs> right, at the moment. right now. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, honestly, I think right now it's going to be a toss up between uh, Deuteronomy and Proverbs. Mm. Uh, and part of the reason is because of how related I think those books are. Um, so, Deuteronomy is very much, especially early on, a message of do this so that you can flourish. Mm -hmm. Do this so that it will go well with you, so that you'll actually experience the blessings that God has for you. You know, you think about Deuteronomy as just being, well, it's the law. Mm -hmm. Indeed, there's law in Deuteronomy, but the, the early parts, chapters 1 through 11, are much more Moses just pleading with God's people, will you just do what God asks you to do mm -hmm. so that it will go well with you? And I think that's exactly what the book of Proverbs is, is doing as well. Yeah. And Inter funny enough, not on topic here, but a lot of Christians find it easy to apply the book of Proverbs, but not easy to apply the book of Deuteronomy yeah. when they essentially have a very similar message. And so it would be a toss up between those two right now. Okay, nice. Favorite hymn? Favorite hymn. I know we were just listening to David Crowder. He just <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, that doesn't count. Um, <laughs> Unless he's singing like, you know. Yes, uh, like a hymn. So... Oh man, you caught me on this one. I didn't. Uh, I didn't think about this one much ahead of time. But um, this time of year, we're close to Christmas in Advent season, and so "Come Thou Long Expected Jesus" mm. is is a good one. I I think of the hope of the intertestamental period, the Christians or Israelites during the intertestamental period that would have been expecting Jesus, hoping for this Messiah to come. And I think we find ourselves in that same situation even now, where we can boisterously say, come thou long expected Jesus. Mm -hmm. Like, will you please come already? Um, so that's a, that's a good one this time of year. Um, there is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins. Is, uh, there's so many good ones, but. Yeah, that one, yeah. I love that one too. Uh, uh, let's see. Favorite, favorite books besides the Bible. Hmm. So I'm going to work my way backwards historically here, and I'm going to start with Desiring God by John yeah. Piper. Yeah. And I'm working backwards historically because that's going to take me naturally to Religious Affections by Jonathan Edwards. Yeah. Uh, so if I kind of go to the root of, of that favorite book, it would be Jonathan Edwards' Religious Affections. Okay. Um, massively formative in my understanding of... Uh, 
religious affection that is maybe separated and ought to be separated from any kind of physical outworking of religion, mm -hmm. but that the physical outworking is indeed fueled by the affection and the affection is fueled by the Spirit of God. So yeah. um, John Piper in Desiring God flushes all of that same stuff out, but um, Edwards is just... Yeah, Edwards is just old when he says it. <laughs> yeah, old stuff's always good. A uh, couple more. Favorite film? Movies? Favorite film. Yeah, movies. Or film. Favorite movies. <laughs> oh, man. I know. I, yeah, I can't go with Disney, right? Um, so I've got... Uh, what I have in mind here is... Uh, I probably can't uh, share. <laughs> I mean, yeah, um, the kids at home. Yeah, no, so I, I've got favorite parts of movies. Yeah. Um, I don't know if I have like a favorite movie. Okay. What's a favorite part? Oh, man, I don't know if I can share that either. <laughs> so the one that's coming to my mind here is um, is Anne Hathaway's portrayal of I Dreamed a Dream in Les Miserables. Oh, okay. Uh, the most, it's Anne Hathaway's version of it that sure. I'm remembering particularly, but just the, it's such a gripping moment of the movie, such a tumultuous moment of the movie. Yeah. I don't know if you're familiar with the story, but it's, Begley. so the scenario is absolutely atrocious. Uh, you know, she's just been taken advantage of and is, has lost her child and is dreaming this dream of times gone by. And the way she portrays it is just incredible. Wow. You, you feel the, the pain that's more of probably an acting favorite thing, but I do love that movie as mm -hmm. well, even though they're all singing their lines in a yeah. pretty funny way. My kids make fun of it. Musicals. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Either you love a musical or you hate a musical. I know it. I, I know it. There's no other in between. Newsies is good. Yeah. Our kids love Newsies, but Newsies. yeah. yeah. I, I, now I'm in the musical genre. If we jump to like. <laughs> hey, I mean, that's fine too. Historical movies. You know, I might be landing with something like Braveheart or. Yeah. Patriot or something like that, but yeah. it's been a while since I've seen those, so I'm sure there are moments of those movies that yeah, I should like, not like them. But yeah, it's like when you go back and watch Home Alone, and you're like, "What? <laughs> yeah, you're like, Why was I watching this when I was ten? Like, yeah, that's how, right. How did my parents let me do that? That's right. Um, yeah, it was the '90s, I guess. Yeah. I uh, and lastly, so favorite food, and then we'll get to the main course of our favorite conversation. Favorite food, anything with sugar. <laughs> it was sugar. Yeah. I, and this, then, wait a second, Mister. Exercise, Mister Fitness. Oh yeah, with well, sugar. well, you got to do it, I guess. Balance that's out. right. I do. Okay. I I do the fitness so that I can cross eat the sugar. Yeah. Though I'm I'm learning that in my older age, the sugar still it is metabolizing slower and slower <laughs> and slower. So that's true. Yeah, it's good. I do love sweets so. though. What about so Christmas is coming up? Last last subset of that. Then what's the favorite thing? Like you make, Liz makes, uh, relatives, cookies, candies, chocolates. Okay. Yeah, so for this one, I'm going, I'm going salty. Uh, oh, okay. Sausage balls. Oh. Yeah. Nice. I love a sausage ball. Okay. That sounds good. <laughs> and it's sausage, cheese, and bisquick. That's about it. Sounds and if you do it, if you do it just right, they come out almost tasting like a little sausage uh, biscuit. Like a little muffin, sort of like yeah. a McMuffin yeah. thing, yeah. But it's they're called sausage balls, not biscuit balls. So I don't feel bad about the carbs. Yeah, yeah. it's sausage because it's your mostly protein. <laughs> yeah, that's right. The good fats and the proteins yeah, there. That's Who right. cares? Ah, there's a little that's flour right. in there. That's okay. That's okay. There's some popular talk in the last few years of unhitching or detaching the Old Testament from the New Testament. Mm, okay. um, a lot of uh, people want to do this. There's, you know, they might have a good reason why they want to do it. or mm -hmm. you know, We don't talk about it as much. Obviously, it's a little more, like you mentioned, there's a little more law. Um, but, or it's longer, there's genealogies, yeah, yeah. you know, there's a lot bigger history. We don't understand, you know, the Hebrew translation to English versus the Greek to English. Um, so it's some stuff gets lost, mm -hmm. I think, in, in, for the average believer. Um, why should, should we, or should we not unhitch the Old Testament from the New Testament? Okay. Probably not since that's you're, right, that's, right. For, yeah, since so that's your I field. Say, that's the easy <laughs> one, actually. I, I appreciate that softball there. Yeah. The first well, one. Yeah. So I, I would obviously say no, that we, that we cannot unhitch. Not only should we not, but we cannot unhitch mm -hmm. the Old Testament from the New Testament. Uh, in fact, the very, the very concept of thinking of it as old and new requires us to think of it as a whole mm -hmm. set of scriptures. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, so if you wanted to say something like, can we detach or unhitch the Hebrew Bible 
from the New Testament. Now you might have a different conversation to have. I still mm. would say no, yeah. but to call it the Old Testament, we need to unhitch the Old Testament. We simply cannot do that as, as Christians. Uh, we should not and we cannot because we believe uh, in a set of 66 books that we call Scripture, 39 mm-hmm. of which are Old Testament, 27 of which are New Testament. Mm-hmm. These are our Scriptures. And so we, we cannot separate them and just neglect any part of that. So, so I don't know if that helps no. answer yeah, that I question. I, I, I think it's, it's a pretty straightforward just, answer. I yeah. Talk really more about why. Yeah. Did you ask the why question yet? Or uh, not yet. I want to make sure. Yeah. That I haven't moved out of that. Well, no, I yeah, think so you're I, good. I, I just want to make sure that I'm not blocking you in any way because I actually didn't record it when I was. Um, if you're thinking it's unimportant because it doesn't apply directly to our lives, then maybe I would encourage that person to investigate the Old Testament a little bit more to see how very many, if not well, all of the principles do apply directly to our lives. So, okay, maybe a particular law doesn't apply to our lives today. Um, Sacrifice this animal on this day at this time in this way for this thing. Okay, fine. But the principle behind a sacrifice, that sure better apply to our lives today or else yeah. Christ's sacrifice was, was pointless. Yeah. It's going somewhere, you know, and, and the whole Old Testament is going somewhere. Mm-hmm. And so it, the, the, the answer of it just simply doesn't apply to our lives today, I would investigate that more. Why are you saying that? Yeah. What do you think doesn't apply? Because I think that if you dive in deep enough, you can find there are a lot of places where it does apply, at least, if, if not directly, at least in principle, mm-hmm. directly. And, and I would also um, encourage that person to think more theologically about Scripture and less, this is going to sound bad, but <laughs> less ethically about Scripture. Okay. So wh- here's what I mean Cut by, that. yeah, well, here's what I mean by that. And I, I, I'm going to clarify my terms because yeah. I need to. But what I mean by that is when we think of the Old Testament ethically, certainly the Old Testament gives us ethics, Mm -hmm. but when we approach it ethically, what we're asking the Old Testament to tell us is we're asking it to tell us what can I do and what can't I do? Mm -hmm. What should I do and what shouldn't I do? And I'm not sure that that's the purpose of the Old Testament, Mm -hmm. at least insofar as it theologically is building this Well, it's building this theology of God as creator, Mm -hmm. man as fallen, and God as redeeming all of it. Mm -hmm. And and so you get these patterns throughout the Old Testament of God, of people falling away, God restoring them uh, in various ways. The judges is a great example of this. They get restoration, they fall away again. The Lord brings about a a, a deliverer, a judge. And so these cycles happen even in the kingship. Uh, so all this history that kind of feels like, well, that doesn't apply, or mm-hmm. that story didn't tell me ethically what I can and cannot do. In fact, that story about David made it seem like I'm allowed to do something that I cannot do. Yeah. yeah and so all these become like the confusing ethical problems, whereas what the Old Testament is doing, in addition to giving some ethics— is it's building this story of God's interaction with his people that culminates in Christ. Mm -hmm. And so without that story, without that theological undergirding of the Old Testament, then the Christ event just kind of becomes, where'd that come from? Mm-hmm. Right, and so so we. You, well, it's out of nowhere. That's right. right. You you can't lose. Jesus, like you're saying. Yeah, that's right. And where, why do we need a savior to begin with? Yeah, and you just you can't lose that. You can't lose that theological history um, and make sense of the appearance of Christ. Oh, I mean, I wouldn't say so either. Yeah. We can see that clearly with with um, the Old Testament and the New Testament throughout uh, history. That's right. We can go back and see that the Christian church, we've used this. I mean, lest we not forget that the disciples, the apostles, their Bible was That's right. the Hebrew text. Right? Yeah. And, you know. Sometimes it's in Septuagint, right, which is the Greek translation and so on. Sure. Um, but that's what they're using. And so we kind of forget, like, oh, we just get this prepackaged deal that somehow got dropped down from heaven, kind of like a FedEx. Yeah. And here's God, 66 books, you're good. And if you don't like the first, you know, 75% of it, that's cool. Just ignore 
ignore that. Yeah. And just use the other, you know, love people, Jesus. And well, but even if even if you only accept the the twenty seven books of the New Testament, even if that's and even if that's all you have. I, I didn't do this search. I thought about this, but like I didn't do this search. But like, how many times do they say according to the scriptures? Bingo. Or they say it was as as the prophet said, mm-hmm. or this was to fulfill what the prophet said, and then they quote Isaiah. So like the New Testament as authoritative scripture is referring back to the scriptures, yeah. you know, and and so if that's if they're referring to the Old Testament scriptures, then the New Testament authors are will not allow us to to detach or unhitch the Old Testament. Right. Um, even though, unfortunately, I think in our culture today, many times we that, that functionally that's what functionally, we do. We do do it. Yeah, and yeah. like you're saying, because we think, well, Proverbs, that's great. You know, 31 <clears throat> books I can read each day, and you know, get some nice wisdom. And there's been a lot of secular works that have even focused on that and kind of you know not hijacked. Maybe is the best word, but maybe. Um, wisdom from Solomon and yeah. then we ignore Deuteronomy or Genesis or uh, Exodus, right? Or Isaiah mm-hmm. or some of these other, you know, really essential. Um, Zephaniah. Books. That's right. Zephaniah. <laughs> Habakkuk. Habakkuk. Yeah. For like 14 Ks. Um, yeah, that's good. I mean, and it really does show like, you know, where did John the Baptist come from, right? He's yep, in the New Testament. Right. And, but why, why is he doing that? Why is he in the wilderness? Why is he, you know, calling out brood of vipers and, and, you know, you need to repent, you know, the winnowing fork is at the, at, in his hand and threshing floor and all that. And you think, where'd this guy come from? Yeah. You know, like this guy's just a Looney Tunes sort of crazy guy. Uh, and of course he gets his head cut off and, and all that. Um, but why was he doing that? Well, in the spirit of Elijah. That's right. Uh, and, and going back further. And, and all of those, all of those images and all of those happenings in the life of John the Baptist, they make sense because the Old Testament leads that direction. Yeah. And so, so yeah, it, it, things like that, you, again, if you just read the New Testament without the Old Testament, and I, I don't think there's a lot of Christians, I don't think there's a lot of Christians who that's their desire is to read the New Testament apart from the Old Testament. Mm-hmm. But like we mentioned a minute ago, I think functionally that's, that's oftentimes what we do because the Old Testament's hard yeah, and it's, it's long. And I, I tell my students a lot of times that you have to read swaths of chapters in order to kind of get where this thing is going, yeah. but it's worth the work. You know, it, it's a little bit harder work. Maybe you have to dig a little bit deeper to find out, figure out what are these idioms. Um, there are of course the moral ethical problems of violence in the Old Testament and things like that, that I, I'll be the first one to tell you it's, it is difficult, mm-hmm. but that doesn't mean that we can just dismiss it um, intentionally or accidentally ignore it. You right. know, I um, had a student one time catch me in the hallway and he said, uh, he said, hey, Dr. Howe, yeah, what you got? He said, I've got an Old Testament conundrum for you. I'm like, brother, my life is an Old Testament <laughs> conundrum. So, so you know, the the difficulty of the Old Testament is not um, it's not, uh, it's not hidden. Like we, we know that. Um, but that alone is not an excuse to dismiss it, you yeah. know? And, and I think, again, most Christians aren't trying to do that, but, but we functionally do because it's hard. Right. And yeah, and, and when we, when we do, uh, I would say too, that it's, we don't know, we start to forget or not understand why X and Y and Z are in the New Testament. Mm-hmm. Why is Jesus yep. talking about that? I mean, looking at the Gospels um, and just the the reference points, like you said, with uh, as the Scripture says or as the prophet says. I mean, Jesus, you know, his favorite book was Deuteronomy, or at least mm-hmm. what we have recorded. Mm-hmm. Speaking of Deuteronomy, and so many other times, and looking at you know the the Book of Hebrews and and this commentary yeah, that's right. on you know whoever wrote it. Um, he clearly knew Hebrew, and he clearly yep. knew the the structure of of Israel. Uh, obviously, knew Greek really well too. So there is that level of wh- where does this come from? Why why is why is he writing to these people? What is he? Well, how is Jesus better than Moses? Who's this Moses guy? Mm-hmm. I mean, if we just completely ignore it, you know, you lose Moses, you lose Abraham, yep. you lose Adam, right? You lose Noah, you lose everybody. You know, in That's the days right. of Noah, so shall come in, son of man, be Jesus says, and 
Yeah, Romans Christ being five. a Christ being a second Adam. That's where you were going. Yeah, yeah. that's right. Romans five, first Adam, second Adam. It makes no sense yeah. if there's no record of the first Adam. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It, it sounds good, but then you're just confused. If really <laughs> that's all you have, we then have to ask. So people don't do it intentionally, but have people done it intentionally in the past? Have people mm. um, ignored? <laughs> right. They've, yeah. How far in the past? As far as we need to in go. In the last couple of years. In the last couple, definitely in the last couple of years. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so... Don't name any names. Yeah, it, well, uh, yeah. No, no, I don't need to. Uh, Oop, I heard it. Uh, yeah, so um, so the answer is yes. Uh, it, it has been done in the past. And I, I think probably the, uh, at least in academia, I know the, the well-known historical figure who dismissed the Old Testament was Marcion. Mm-hmm. Um, lived at the turn of the second century, so into the into the first century, into the early part, middle part of the second century, and um, explicitly and intentionally uh, dismissed the Old Testament mm-hmm. because of this this concept of it, honestly, it was the concept of the violence of mm-hmm. the Old Testament God versus the uh, mercy and grace and kindness of the New Testament, Jesus. Mm -hmm. And so he kind of argued that if Jesus is God, and then you've got this God of the Old Testament and this God of the New Testament in Jesus, those are two different characters. Dualism. That's right. That's right. And so in order to fix that, and uh, the best I understand it, Marcion understood, uh, he thought that Paul was the preeminent disciple of Christ. So he accepted primarily Paul's writings. Mm -hmm. Uh, only the Gospel of Luke was the only one that he accepted, yeah. uh, and then pretty much dismissed everything else because it had this this dualistic kind of idea in God. Yeah. Now we of course know from the whole body of Scripture that there isn't this dualism in the Godhead, um, and so again because of the reasons we've mentioned already, we can't dismiss the Old Testament, though essentially on the same grounds as we mentioned a moment ago, that it's just difficult. You've got this difficult concept of violence in the Old Testament. Um, Because of that, Marcion chose intentionally to say those are not canonical books. Which is interesting because you think, you know, he would have just gotten rid of some, but he ended up getting rid of all. Um, Which I think, you know, oftentimes we, you know, I'm, I'm a history guy, I love history, and we think, oh, you know, we're so smart now, we wouldn't have done that. Or they were different as we were different. But it's like, but if you're taking a direct approach to Scripture, God creates Adam and Eve, and we fall, and it's been, you know, downhill ever since, people really aren't any different. There That's might right. be new gadgets and new technologies like we're doing right now, but people still have conversations, people still struggle with stuff, people still got married, people still had children, people still mm-hmm. worked. And so there's still questions and a lot of times people will have an idea that, well, they, they did that or they just accepted it or, you know, the miracles of the Bible, you know, but we can see even in the New Testament, you know, I believe help my unbelief. You know, people mm-hmm, don't right. see, they're seeing a miracle as it happens and they're still like, I don't think so. Or yeah. Like what? Or they're saying, I really want to believe that. I just can't. Yeah. You know, the, exactly. I believe help my unbelief. Yeah. Yeah. You have particularly. People, uh, and, and that's a lot of people have. I'm an atheist. I'm an agnostic, and they say that's my reason why God mm-hmm. should needs to He needs to do this or that for me. Uh, and it's just well, people did that then, and they they didn't believe. Yeah, but some did. You know, um, in my uh, in my any history classes, ancient Near Eastern history classes, I, um, I I point out to the students that we are different than the ancients mm-hmm. in a lot of ways, but as as humans, as image bearers, we're really no different. Yeah, right. We, we're thinking. Uh, you know, people oftentimes will point to technology as, oh, we're different. We're so much smarter. I'm like, look, you still don't know who built the pyramids. You <laughs> know, people like, don't know the passwords to their phones. <laughs> that's else, right. So, so uh, it, it's not an harder. it's not an intelligence difference, right? And and as far as uh, you know, ancient wisdom compared to modern wisdom, like mm-hmm. there's or even ancient wisdom in Israel compared to ancient wisdom in the in the in the rest of the ancient world, you're going to find a lot of similarities precisely because everybody is wrestling with the same fundamental problems of human life. Mm-hmm. You know, and you, those same wisdom nuggets we find in our world today are beneficial because we're still wrestling with what does wise living in the eyes of God look like? Yeah. And so as human beings, as image bearers, we're really, there's, there really is not much of a difference. And so as we look back at the Old Testament, even 
in, in direct application kinds of ways, we can look and we can, we can watch David crying out to God in the Psalms and we can say, I have felt that low in my life mm, and I need that. Um, that Psalm gives me a voice to cry out to God as the only one who can help me. Mm. But you only get that if you can identify with David as an image bearer. As a human being, not just an old, different dude. Right. You know what I'm saying? And he's just so far off. And That's know, right. He's a king, or he's this or that. You can't really relate. Yeah. That's good. Um, yeah, Marcion definitely popped into my mind, too. Uh, just back to him for a moment. Um, and the and kind of coupling with what we do now, and again, similar to what people did then, is like what we do now, where you don't, arguments, lines of thinking don't stop. At a certain point, with if you just draw the line, you know it's easier to constantly be battling for conservative whatever versus you know there's a slow drift of liberalism. That's kind of how mm-hmm. you know, politics go, how theology goes, uh, even just a lot of just cultural trends. And so it's you have to kind of cut off and stop and say, no, we're not going to do this. We're going to do this, and you know kind of conserve what's what's left or what's there or what used to be there maybe. But for Marcion, it wasn't even just the Old Testament. But it was also much of the New Testament. Yeah, that's right. Like you said, you know, he didn't, so it didn't like, oh, I'm getting rid of the Old Testament. But the New Testament, you know, I love the 27 books. Those are great. Well, no, Matthew's a little weird. That's too Jewish. And John, that was <laughs> yeah. too late. And of course, he doesn't like Hebrews. He doesn't like James, you know, and there's a bunch of other things. You're like, now what do you have? Yeah. And it, I don't even think he had all of Luke, you know, so it was just kind of this butchered up sort of thing, which, yep. you know, sadly, you know, there's nothing new under the sun and there's cults and heretical groups that pop up all the time. And, you know, sadly we can see that. I mean, I think even within the, the church today, whether they're intentionally trying to do it or not, there's these old stuff that kind of keeps coming up yeah. and we, and we battle it and think that's, that sounds good. And it's like, well, we've already been here and mm-hmm. it doesn't work. This is bad yeah. news. And a lot of those arguments will come from proof texting scriptures, right? I mean, the, these groups can find a scripture and say, there it is. There's why we believe what we believe. Yeah. But it's heretical because they've dismissed the whole of Revelation. Yeah. Um, and, and so what, again, we, the benefit of not unhitching the Old Testament, but actually including it in our doctrine of Scripture, uh, is, is that we have somewhat of this system of checks and balances where we let Scripture interpret Scripture. And so we begin to understand more of um, where these heretical groups may be coming from as they try to proof text certain scriptures, we now have a, a bigger body of scripture to pull from and say, uh, no, that's that's not quite right, and here's and here's why. Yeah. So. Yeah, no, that's good. And I mean, it's definitely something that, again, it's reading the Bible takes work, right? That's right. Uh, and and knowing um, you can't just kind of drop in. Although we tend to do that, you know, and we like our favorite passages or our favorite books. Uh, and I think as as you know, the older you progress. Uh, or the longer you progress in, in the Christian faith, you know, there are certain passages that may resonate more, sure. or certain uh, verses, and depending on when you come to faith, whether you're a child or an adult, other things that kind of are more familiar. Yep. Um, but yeah, I think there's definitely uh, a lot of wisdom, obviously, in danger in, in both neglecting it intentionally or unintentionally. Yeah, that's right. Uh, we, we, you know, we can see certain trends you know, we kind of smell the liberalism, you know, and it's kind of coming and we're not going to do that, that, but when we do things unintentionally, like you're yeah. saying, where there's an unintentional, you know, when was the last time you read something from the Old Testament? Mm-hmm. Uh, not you, but in general. And <laughs> Earlier today. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> that's right. It was in Hebrew, of course. Um, and, and it's easy. I mean, I've done that too, where you're sure. just kind of like, I don't know what to read, Lord, I'm just going to bust up James, or I'm going to look at John, or I'm going to, you know, I'm, let's look at Acts and see where we're at. Um, and, you know, we, we tend to, depending on our temperament and, you know, what's going on in our lives, we want to gravitate towards one or the other. And yeah. a lot of times we get stuck with, all right, I'm going to read through the Bible in the year. You know, mm-hmm. get stuck in Leviticus or, or Exodus or something. And you're like, how does that apply? And why would that happen? And I'm not sure. And, and then you're done. And then you're done. Yeah. You know, and you're like, I don't know. I'm just going to go back and read. Next yeah. Year. And you're, you're laying out several things related to us as individuals, but I think also just in the church as yeah. a whole, 
Um, one of the things that I appreciate around here is so many of my colleagues who are pastors and I hear about what they're preaching mm. and they're, they're making intentional efforts to preach New Testament and Old Testament, right? And, and I know that a lot of times in the church, and I, I think to some degree, I get this, that we are the New Testament church, mm -hmm. right? So I get that. New covenant. Right? Yeah, I get that. But like, um, but there's, there has to be an intentional effort even in the church to keep these scriptures in front of our people. Right. Otherwise, when, when the congregants go home and they are trying to figure out what am I going to dive into next, they might not even know that uh, Habakkuk exists, yeah. you know, but much less yeah. is that where I want to go to read? Mm -hmm. um, you know, is that where I need to go to read? Uh, and so, you know, and I get it in a, let's say, good grief in a perfect world or in a in an, in an excellent scenario, let's say a pastor has a 40-year tenure, you know, I mean, good night. I don't know that those even exist anymore, but yeah. pray to the Lord they will. But let's say a 40-year tenure, I, you're not going to get through the whole Bible. Like, mm -hmm. you, you might, and I'm, but you're going to have to leave some things out. It's just, that's hard. I get it. But when I see pastors saying, hey, on Sunday mornings, we're working through uh, James, and on Sunday nights, we're working through First and Second Samuel, I'm like, Yes, yeah. um, because you're now keeping in front of your people um, as the church. You're keeping in front of them all of these books so that now they have they have the tools they need to go read those on their own. Right. And it gives you more of a foundation, I would say. You know, right? Oh, yeah. So you're, cause, because you're not sure where where does this come from otherwise. That's right. Or where is it? What, what scriptures is he talking about? And then sometimes people will, you know, they'll dig a little deeper and say, OK, well, let me look at the cross reference. And then they'll get hung up. It's like, well, it's not exactly the same. <laughs> yeah, that's you know, right. Explain that a little bit for, for those of us. I mean, yeah. Oh, man. So you look at a cross. So say okay. you read something in the New Testament. Okay. And it's, and it's referencing you know, Genesis or it's referencing Deuteronomy. <clears throat> uh, and then you go back to Deuteronomy. Why is it oftentimes not word for word or very, very close word, word for word? Man, that's a good question. Uh, <laughs> I, so, no, that's a good one. I, I, that's a great question. Um, there's a few reasons. Let me, I'll give you a few reasons why it may not be word for word. And then I'll give you, uh, an example that is very subtle, but it's one that I've just been looking at in my own mind. And so it's fresh on my brain. Um, a couple of reasons why I think that it doesn't look the same. Number one is the New Testament author could be quoting from the Septuagint, mm -hmm. uh, which is a translation. And so... Of the of the Hebrew originals from, into Greek. Correct. Yeah, that's right. So, sorry, I, I meant to, that, I was trying to clarify that, and it didn't come out right. <laughs> yeah. So they may be quoting from the Septuagint, which at times does take translational liberties. Yeah. Now, the other reason that I think this that it may sound different in the New Testament versus the cross reference is because uh, the New Testament authors are doing the like what we would call a mashup, mm -hmm. right? They're they're taking several scriptures that they know from memory, or at least pieces of scriptures that they know from memory, and putting them <laughs> together. It says, it, yeah. That's exactly right. Yeah. I mean, and they'll say that it, it says somewhere, yeah. and then quote something. All the time, does that. Yeah, and and you know we've got this whole concept of like, well, it's a New Testament author, and he can do whatever he wants to do. Yeah, I get it. Okay, um, <laughs> he was inspired. But yeah, but what they're True. doing is they're they're taking. Scripture. I mean, these are all even if even in a in a mashup, you can find where they are referring to what scriptures they're referring to, even though they've mashed them up in a certain way, mm -hmm. and so so that will oftentimes sound different as well. But it's a completely explainable reason for why it sounds different. In other words, we don't have to look at the we don't have to look at the cross reference and say the New Testament author was wrong, right? And or, or it's a um, what's it called? Contradiction. That's right. That's exactly right. So there, there are good reasons for this. Um, let me give you a, an example of the one that I'm thinking of right now. It, I hope this is a good example. It may or may not work, but um, the uh, Isaiah seven fourteen that's quoted in Matthew one uh, verse twenty three. Uh, Behold, a virgin shall give birth, and his his name shall be called Emmanuel. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a few things going on there that even in the Hebrew text is a little bit different. But Matthew quotes directly from the Septuagint, from the Greek translation. Okay. It's exactly from the Greek translation, except for one thing. The verb in the Greek says, um, you will call his name Emmanuel, 
interesting. The Hebrew text says she will call his name Emmanuel, the virgin who gives birth. And um, Matthew uses a plural verb. They will call wow. his name Emmanuel. Okay, so same passage, Isaiah yeah. seven fourteen, but you've got these differences of that one of the subject. And in, in Greek, the subject is embedded in the verb in Hebrew as well. So it's not a separate word, but it's you you know that the the subject is a little different. Mm -hmm. And from the commentaries that I've looked at um, on this particular one, they they primarily argue that for Matthew, the word they became more uh, expansive, mm -hmm. and so. In, in a couple of ways. Number one, in that particular passage, as Joseph is naming Jesus, the they uh, stretches further than the she of the Hebrew text, particularly the mother, or the you of the Septuagint that probably is referring to Isaiah, the father of this young child. Mm -hmm. um, that, that's a whole different conversation that we would have to get into on Isaiah 7, 14. Yeah. But um, there was a historical fulfillment in Isaiah 7 and 8 with the syro ephraimite war. And then Matthew, of course, makes this explicit that this is really referring to Jesus. Right. So that's one of those many shadows of the Old That's Testament. correct. That's correct. So but back to this verb and subject thing, the you and the Septuagint is probably Isaiah. Mm -hmm. So you've got the wife, the father in those texts. And then in Matthew, you get they. Well, that can include Joseph now. And that becomes the important piece of, of Matthew 1, where Jesus is the son of David, but Joseph as the father is in the lineage of David. Mm -hmm. So Joseph is the one who will name Jesus, and by doing so, claiming him as his son. Jesus is now the son of David, mm -hmm. because Joseph, a Davidide, said, this is your name. Yeah. The they that Matthew uses makes that possible. It's not just a she of the Hebrew text. So, so, so there's, wow. there's that element that's pretty neat. It also then expands it out even further to the Gentiles who will come in, to the Jews who will come in to the kingdom of God, mm -hmm. that, that anybody who recognizes this man as God with us, there we go. Yeah. And, and so I don't know if I'm prepared yet to say that Matthew intentionally changed that verbal form mm -hmm. to include a plural subject but it's it certain spirit, spiritual. that's there you, go. you can at least say that yeah. right but it it definitely it definitely points to this isn't just a willy-nilly oops i missed the quote yeah the new testament authors are using scripture intentionally uh to to make their arguments about who christ is who god is mm -hmm. and and how he works in this world um and that oftentimes requires a little bit of knowledge of Isaiah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know, and, and that's and that's wonderful. I mean, that's and there's probably what dozens, maybe hundreds of those. Oh yeah, I would say oh, yeah. uh, that are referencing, like you said earlier, with having a knowledge of the New Testament, and it's not just a matter of, well, I'm not sure what this is referencing. This is referencing something uh, in the past, but I don't really need to know it. It's, yeah, it's the foundation. That you know, like having a house. You're like, well, I'm going to have this is a beautiful house, but who cares about the foundation? It's like, well, <laughs> you, you need it. You need the foundation. <laughs> yeah. You might not see the foundation. You might not care about the foundation as far as aesthetics go, but you need the you foundation. You need it, yeah. Uh, I mean, case in point, minimum, base minimum is where do we get sin from? You know, what, yeah. why do we need a yeah. Savior to begin with? Uh, why would God so love the world that he gave his son um, if there wasn't a problem? Where would that problem come from? I don't know. There's just some problem somewhere. Yeah. No, it's Genesis you know, one, two, and three, we see That's right. how God creates and then the fall of humanity. And uh, when Paul lays that out in Romans 3, he refers to the Old Testament to say, yeah. all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Yeah. That's a, you know, so he, did he, where did he, did he make that up? Did it become scripture when he quoted it? No, yeah. Yeah, that exactly. book is scripture. So. Yeah. And then follows it up two chapters later in Romans 5 with, hey, this is a real guy. This is a real That's guy. Right. And these things matter. You can't just have this fictional one, which is fairly popular among and some people. real as in historical right like he actually yeah, existed not this, just like imaginary yeah, in my mind yeah this adam of genesis one is not just a and three is not just a literary character mm -hmm. that uh i was going to say moses but people that would deny the historicity of adam would probably deny the authorship of moses as yeah. well of the pentateuch but Certainly. it's not just a literary character that the old testament presents as a well 
this is archetypal, yeah. you know, or you know, whatever it may be. It's no, that he actually lived, yeah, and he actually sinned, yeah, and therefore yeah. we need an actual savior. Yeah, amen. All right, thank you so much. I appreciate yep. uh, the conversation. It's wonderful. Um, you have a couple quick books you'd recommend. I do. Um, I actually have them right the- here as I knock my whole bookshelf over. Um, so I, I've got these two here that I would recommend. One of them is more specifically about an issue of Old Testament that I think a, can be a helpful book. The other one is going to be more of just this big picture of the Old Testament. So the one about the big picture of the Old Testament is uh, Peter Gentry and Stephen Wellam's uh, God's Kingdom Through God's Covenants. Uh, there actually is a larger book called Kingdom Through Covenant that these guys wrote, That's right. um, but it's it's far more technical. This one's going to be a little more accessible to um, guys like me who are a little more average, mm-hmm. more accessible, but it's going to give you this bigger overarching picture of what we might think of as biblical theology. So as we think about this concept of letting the Old Testament tell this story that leads to Christ, that as these covenants are laid down, there's continuity with what God is doing in the world. And there's a little bit of discontinuity with what God is doing in the world. They help to paint that picture so that you at least can put yourself as you're reading the Old Testament in the right framework uh, of how God is working in that particular period, um, both consistently throughout the Bible, but then also maybe the law is a little different than the new covenant, you know, things like that. Mm -hmm. So that one will be helpful there. And then the other one is about the law specifically. This is Old Testament law for Christians Um, Original Context and Enduring Application uh, by Roy Gain. And uh, this one's going to be, it's a newer book that's out about Old Testament law, pretty thick, kind of technical. Um, But one of the things that he will bring up in here that I think becomes helpful is the concept I mentioned at the very beginning of of seeing the law more as wisdom Mm. uh, and less as ethics. So what it becomes then is, Uh, it's not that the law doesn't give us ethics. It does. But what it is, is you are my people. Now here's how you flourish as my people. Um, It's not, this is what you do to earn your status as my people. I read, that's right. I redeemed you out of Egypt. Now here's how you flourish as my people. Uh, So approaching the law more from from that perspective, which is exact, I think, consistent with the New Testament presentation of sanctification. Yeah. Um, you know, we become more like Christ. We flourish as image bearers as we work out our own salvation with fear and trembling because it's God who is at work in us. Right. Um, yeah. It's a work he's done. It's a work he's still doing, but, but we've, we've, we've got to obey. Right. We have to obey. That's good. And so, yeah, no hands, no here. yeah. That's good. Well, I appreciate, again, the conversation. Yeah, my pleasure. Uh, this has been our inaugural episode uh, of Colloquium Contra Mundum. I uh, hope you enjoyed. Please comment below. Um, I'll drop down Dr. Howell's information, uh, Twitter, and uh, maybe email, or Facebook, that sort of thing. So uh, until next time, be against the world for the sake of the world. Take care. <clears throat> so that's that, that's that. Okay. Ready? All right. Hi, I'm Richard, and this is Contra. Let's do that again. What's it called? Colloquium Contramundum. That's what it's called. Yep. All right.